Welcome back to A Plus Parents, everyone. And I'm actually, I'm really excited about our episode today because we're going to talk about languages and we've got an expert in the field of languages. So I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Cecilia, uh, nope, Celia. So Dr. Celia Shimon Zamora, I had to practice saying her name and uh, <laughs> she's PhD. She has a certification called CAE, which stands for the Certified Association Executive, which allows her to be able to do things like run nonprofits and uh, you know be an executive at that level. So she's uh, she's super high end. She lives in Florida, so super super happy to have her here, come from my backyard. And right now, she currently serves as the director of professional learning and certification for an organization called Actful. So I'm going to have her tell you what that is. Uh, but she served in the, you know, in the education field since 2005. Uh, she's worked in public and private schools. She's worked with corporations, with nonprofits. Uh, she's a homeschool mom and they're a homeschooling family. So, you know, if you ever thought about what's it like to be busy? Well, Dr. Dr. Zamora, she's got that one. She can put the check mark in that box. So I'm going to have her tell you a little bit more about, you know, what, you know, her background and her, her own, her own heritage is from, she's Venezuelan and Cuban. So she has a, uh, but kind of funny, like we all kind of find out, we all kind of head back that we come from Spain somehow, some way, right? I know even my, my heritage and my name is uh, actually from a little town in Spain. So kind of fun as that is. So, you, you know, having a doctorate, and if you've ever thought about you know, graduate school and moving on to the higher education. So Dr. Zamora, she has her doctoral degree in Spanish applied linguistics. Now that sounds pretty cool, but what's really cool is it's from Georgetown University. So Georgetown grad, that's really, really cool. And all right, I'm gonna see if I can get all this. It was awarded the Harold N. Glassman Distinguished Dissertation Award in Social Sciences. So you have definitely have to tell us about what that is because you know, it's one thing to get a PhD, but then to be awarded something at the level it was for your dissertation, that's pretty cool. So we'll have you share a little bit about that as well. Um, she has spoken up to five languages and she's still fluent in most of those and taking on new ones as we go. So first of all, you know, doc, I'm just going to call you Dr. Celia. Celia is that okay? Yeah, Celia's okay, fine perfect. too. Celia, well, Celia's fine, yeah. All right, perfect. Well, see, we're really, really excited to have you here and welcome to the podcast. And um, anything else you want to add to that? Because that's quite a resume. No, I, I think definitely, you know, A plus parenting and, you know, having type A personalities really meshes. So, I mean, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm just so happy to be here. Absolutely. All right. So, we, you know, first, when I, I do want to ask you, because so there's some questions I obviously want to ask about languages and things like that. But, you know, I, I know already with introducing you and just everything that, you know, people can hear what you're up to and the things you've done and the accomplishments you had and your homeschooling family on top of that. So, how do you do it all? <laughs> well, um, lots of coffee. I think that's a really big one. Lots of coffee <laughs> and really um, just a lot of planning and organizing and time management, prioritizing the things that are important, making sure that I always make time and try to balance as many things as possible, balance my, you know, head, getting ahead of my career, balance homeschooling, being there for my family and also self-care. So making sure that you prioritize and, and learn how to say no to things or Yes, but not right now, I think are uh, the most important parts. Yeah, I, I tend to get into that kind of yes, but not right now. I see that myself sometimes as well. So yeah, <laughs> <really good. laughs> I like it because you know it's coming, but we're just not right now. So that's great. Exactly. All right, so, you know, for young people, uh, I know my daughter, my daughter speaks uh, four languages. You know, she's been you just uh, a total advocate for learning languages. And her mom and I have always been about, you know, she she told us we we're on a cruise and she might have been, I don't know, eight or nine years old. And the uh, the cruise director came out and said hello in seven different languages to everybody that was on the cruise, right? Because it was all it was an international cruise and all these people on there. And she looks up at me. She goes, Daddy, I want to do that. And I, I said, <laughs> you want to do what, honey? She goes, I want to be a cruise director. <laughs> I just thought, well, okay, why do you want to be a cruise director? She said, because he talked in seven languages and that's what I want to do. And I thought, man, knock yourself out. That's great. So yeah, you know, she's actually working towards it, and she she hasn't forgotten that. So she's she just started language number five, and off she goes. So, 
you know, you and, you know, and I see the benefits for her, you know, the doors that opens and opportunities that she has. And, and she just turned 17 and she's already uh, she's already doing internships with companies where they're talking to her while she's still finishing school. So it's pretty, pretty cool what she has going on. So, you know, when you look at the benefits of of teaching or learning another language, what are some of the top benefits that you see in that? And I definitely love to hear about your daughter and about any multilingual kids. So that always really gives me passion. Um, but I think really um, the first benefit, and as you just, just said yourself, she's 17. She already has people kind of like coming to her for internships and jobs. So you cannot negate the professional aspect. Um, the more languages that you speak, the more clientele that you can get in contact with, the more that you can translate, that you can communicate and connect. So of course, having... Um, more degrees, I'm sorry, more languages helps you get higher degrees as well as higher um, opportunities for jobs. But even apart from that, so many research has shown, so many studies have shown that you gain more empathy in your fellow man. You're able to connect and understand other cultures and just be a global citizen. They've actually shown that it lowers the, the percentage of you getting Alzheimer's and dementia when you're older you are better equipped to learn math, critical problem solving, uh, learning an instrument. And honestly, even be being able to communicate in your first language is a lot easier and facilitated by learning other languages. So you become a better writer and a better speaker in your first language while learning another language. So, I mean, really the benefits are just endless for learning other languages. Mm. So, you know, it's like, you know, I know like my daughter, she, we started with English and Spanish when she, you know, from the day, day she arrived, you know, was we would do English and Spanish with her. And so for her to pick up additional languages, really for her, has been, has, I think, I think has been easier because she had that base where she could, yeah. you know, be both. But we, we found it was interesting when she was young, she really had a terrible time translating. So mm -hmm. because she thought in one language and she could speak in that language and she could think in another language to speak in that language, but to translate between the two, she's way better at it now. But when she was young, it was it was hard for her. Do you do you notice? And then I look at myself and I've been practicing, uh, mostly practicing, you know, learning Spanish for myself for the last 10 years. And, you know, and I'm still just you know, I, I think I talk like a three-year-old when it comes to, you know, to speak <laughs> Spanish to people. And my kids make fun of me. So that's about, that's how I know that's how it's going. Right. Uh, but, you know, when you, when you notice, you know, young people, because obviously, you know, people would say, oh yeah, it really is a great idea to learn a new language. Yes. And, you know, starting as young as you can is, is always probably the best way to go. But, you know, depending on where you start and when you start, what are some of the best ways that you've seen to, to learn or that you just want to, or for someone who's trying to teach a language or for someone who's learning the language, what are some of the best ways that you've seen to do that? Absolutely. And to your point, the best time to learn a language is right now, even if you are older, but the earlier you start, the better. There is something called the critical age theory, which says that um, if you start teaching a language or at least exposing children to languages, before they hit puberty, they tend to keep all of that in their internal grammar and they'll be able to utilize it at any point in their lives. As long as they're exposed to it, they'll be able to kind of get that native, you know, diet, variety of, of like, you know, speaking and the accents and so forth. But um, really the best way to learn a language, and this is proven by studies, is to be exposed to the language and force communication. So if you've ever gone to another country, if you've ever gone to, for instance, Spain, or you go to the Dominican Republic, and you are surrounded by the language, you're surrounded in Spanish, the restaurants are in Spanish, the people you're talking with are Spanish, you're going to pick up Spanish a lot faster than if you sit down and just read a book and read a textbook and say, okay, I finished reading the textbook, now I can speak Spanish. So the best way is really to immerse yourself in the language as much as possible social media, media, Netflix, going to like a, a restaurant and just hearing the Spanish. And even if you don't feel confident, force yourself to speak in that language uh, because that is how you're going to get feedback. That's how you're going to learn. And then you start processing. You have a depth of processing in your head that kind of starts putting together the grammar and the vocabulary so that you can then utilize it. So really just immersion, um, practicing and communicating. If you don't speak the language and you're trying to get your children to learn it, there are so many ways to outsource or delegate that to somebody else. You can go to a co-op.
go to um, a language community school or after school program or even Saturday school. Or there are even websites like Preply, and I can give you a link after that, where you can um, contract language tutors that will essentially be conversational partners for you and that you can talk to them. They can kind of adapt the lessons based on the age of your child or for you. Um, and then it's just mostly a conversation partner to force you to speak and listen in the language. Mm, that's awesome. I, I do have a practice and I'll, I'll share this with you because I usually get laughed at, but I'll, I'll share it with you anyway. But, you know, whenever I'm in a Spanish speaking community, uh, I always start my conversation in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but it, and then the people, if they speak English, uh, they and they realize what a struggle it is. They first of all, they appreciate that I'm, you know, making the attempt. Right. And, you know, mess up the words and, and or the verb tenses and what I'm trying to say. But but, you know, but they appreciate the fact that I'm making the attempt. And typically, if they speak English, they'll just say, would you like to speak in English? And I'm like, oh, yes, please. You know, so <laughs> it, it's kind of fun. But but I found that for myself to be true, too. Like when you are in those areas where you're immersed inside of the language. And I think sometimes people get stuck and they think, well, I don't I'm not fluent. And they're a little nervous or a little embarrassed about how it might sound or their accents a particular way. And it's instead it's like people love it and they really yeah. enjoy the fact that you're attempting and you know what most people want to do like you know we just want to make a difference right and so here you are trying so people want to help you and that's I've never had never had anybody to say look just stop you know it's always been like we'll right talk English, and when you say this say it this way and I'm like oh awesome so I get another you know another tip for the day so which is really great <laughs> so you know then you know you looking and somebody um somebody says, and you kind of talked about this, like they only speak English and they, you know, they don't feel comfortable where they're teaching a language and they start to look outside of things. You were kind of, you were talking about some of the resources that people have out there and, you know, like things like co-ops and um, like the Saturday things in the immersion schools that you have. Um, there's so many uh, opportunities, I think, for people. And as you said too, it's like, you can start at any time. And even for me, I know if I really just took you know, just really immerse myself. And it was like, this is all I'm going to do right now yeah. that I'm really comfortable knowing that I could do it, you know, cause I'm like right on the verge of, you know, right now I can communicate, but I can't have a conversation if that makes sense. Like I can say what I right. need or want, but not necessarily that we can have a full conversation, but I love the immersion. And I know a lot of our listeners, they do mission trips and oftentimes the mm -hmm. mission trips are to Latin American companies where or, uh, countries where they're going to be immersed in the language. But I, I think, uh, you know, not being afraid, and I, I really want to get your point of view on this about, you know, what is it like for a non-native speaker that sometimes we, we're a little apprehensive because we think we're going to say it wrong or it's going to not sound right or accent sounds funny. But what's your experience with that as well? Mine's been great. So do you see that as well? <laughs> Well, I mean, absolutely. And one of the things that we do at Actful, which is essentially a nonprofit that promotes multilingualism, multilingualism, multilingualism and multiculturalism in the world and really ensuring that language connects. One of the things we focus on is focus on what you can do with the language. And I always used to tell my students when I used to be a, a language teacher, I would tell my students, think about a monolingual person in this country that only speaks English. I bet you, you cannot name me one person that speaks English perfectly. There's always going to be a grammar they use wrong or a vocabulary that's not quite right or even pronunciation. So if we're thinking that even a monolingual person can't speak English 100% perfect, you're speaking various languages imperfectly and that's perfectly okay because the point of language is to communicate. And I'll tell you an interesting story about that. Um, so I, one of my languages was Italian and I remember I lived in Italy abroad uh, for two summers teaching English to Italian children. And I would go to this one cafe every single morning and in my beautiful Italian, I would say, oh, good morning. I hope you're having a great day. May I please have a coffee? Thank you very much. And every single day I would do that. And then finally the bartender stops me one day and says, you know how I know that you're not a native Italian speaker? Because you're too nice. No one in Italy says, good morning. How are you? Thank you very much. Please just say coffee and then throw your coin and that's it. I'm like, oh, really? He's like, you're speaking Italian with an English mindset. I'm like, huh, you're absolutely right. So then the next week I said coffee and I would throw my coin and then event, you know, they would, I would do the transaction. And a few weeks later, somebody that was nearby asked me, what part of Italy are you from? Because your accent's <laughs> interesting. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, so yeah, it, even just like interacting in the culture and so forth, you're going to make mistakes and that's okay. But like you just said, 
people want to help you. People see that you're trying and they are more than happy and proud to have you immersed in their culture and their language. So most people are really willing to help you. But I also want to keep that momentum going. And when you or anybody else sees a non-native English speaker kind of struggling through, you know, speaking English in our country to definitely reach out and help them and say, hey, you know, I know that you're trying. Here's the best way to speak English or here's like some feedback for you because it obviously goes both ways in a multi, you know, multicultural, multilingual country like we have here. Uh, that's great. You, and I think sometimes people are maybe even be a little resistant to that because they think they don't want to offend, you know, and right. that's funny. Cause that's back to the culture thing right it's like yeah in europe I, i've had the same experience you know please and thank you and they just look at me like no <laughs> yeah right you don't you don't have to say please you don't have to say thank you just what do you want right so yeah <laughs> so that's awesome so you know i i, I stepped over this but i want to come back because i have other questions for you too but tell us about your dissertation because i you know i'm curious about you know what you did in the dissertation and then tell us about the award that you got as well because that's a big deal yeah thank you so much and i do want to say that i had my son my second year of my doctorate um and wow. i was able to graduate and get that award when he was about two almost three years old so that was even prouder and i thanked him in my dissertation i said my first baby is my dissertation and my second baby is jude francis who <laughs> is nine oh. now um, so when I, I, as you had mentioned earlier, um, I am a Venezuelan immigrant who came to the United States when I was six and I grew up in Miami, Florida, um, which is a very Spanish heavy society. Um, I, in fact, depending on which city you go to, you might actually hear more Spanish than English and you'll see billboards in Spanish over English. Um, and then when we went to school, we realized that when we were going to Spanish class, they were teaching us Spanish from a textbook for non-native Spanish speakers. So we were bored out of our minds. But we still didn't necessarily know the grammar in Spanish or how to write in Spanish because we were so far advanced being able to communicate, but we didn't have that explicit um, grammatical instruction. I ended up finding out after I did my first master's that there's a term for that. It's called heritage language speakers, which is when your first language, either because it's at home or because you, you grew up in a different country, is a different language than English. But then you move to an English speaking country where now everything, you are immersed in English, schools in English, friends are in English. So then your first language kind of starts going down and English starts becoming the dominant language. So now you might be very, very, have little proficiency to no proficiency in your first language, or you might be completely fluent. Um, but then we need to really see how the brain works in processing this language. So what my dissertation was, um, was essentially looking at how Spanish heritage speakers, both compared in DC and in Miami, Florida, were able to use depth of processing in the brain to look at very non-salient language grammar. So in Spanish, it was the pluperfect subjunctive in, in the past in third person, which is a very difficult structure that even most native speakers of Spanish don't really use on an everyday basis. So I was comparing how these heritage speakers would process this information in their brains compared to non-native um, non speakers. And then that was able to help us tailor education and tailor language learning to these heritage speakers and honestly do a lot more advocacy, outreach, and empowerment for these learners. Because I'm sure a lot of your listeners probably are heritage speakers themselves, and now they're struggling to pass that language on to their children because they might think that they're not good enough or that it's broken Chinese, broken Spanish. So um, really now my in my role, what I've been doing is a lot of advocacy and empowerment of these learners to let them know your language and what you can do in the language is completely valid and there's a term for you. Wow, that's impressive. And, you know, in going through a dissertation, which I haven't done, so I can't say that I, you know, can feel your pain, right? But what I do know is how much research and data and, you yeah. know, uh, you know, being able to uh, to uh, like the fact finding and to to know that you've got a you've got something that you're trying to show, but then all of the research you have to go through to go back and find the case studies and mm -hmm. you know to have the validity of it. That's really uh, that's impressive, and you know, and then having a newborn uh, and a toddler at home at yeah. the same time that's that's amazing. So okay, so now you know I. In, in my world, I work a lot with teenagers because we do the middle school and high school programs in our in our math program. And, you know, I have this phrase that we say, you know, the grumpy teenagers, like teenagers, they get mm -hmm. to that point. They just, you know, they get grumpy sometimes. And I think it comes with the territory of being a teenager. And there's so many different things going on for them. And, 
uh, you know, when I say grumpy teenager, moms smile and teenagers just get more grumpy. So it's kind of, you know, it kind of <laughs> works like that, right? But, you know, what do you do with a young person? You know, they're kind of getting into those into the years where there, there's so much happening and there's so many mm -hmm. different things that they're trying to to learn and, you know, just for themselves. What happens when you get uh, you get a young person and you as the parent, you're really you really can see the benefit of learning that second language or third language or wherever they are. But young person, they're kind of in that rebellious time, that rebellious period. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you get a young person who says, I just don't want to do that? And that happens quite a lot. I mean, I would say that nine out of 10 times it's going to happen unless you have the rare exception, like your daughter who just always loved languages or like me that I always loved languages. But even me, um, I remember my parents made our house a Spanish only house. We were only allowed to speak Spanish regardless of whatever happened outside. Um, and so then it came to the point that because I was raised in a Spanish only household that my parents spoke English, but it would be weird for me to interact with my parents in English. So I kind of stopped and only did Spanish. Um, so, but it's still going to happen. You're still gonna get rebellious because there is a theory in language called like the law of minimal effort that when you think of, for example, the word want to, when you write down, I want to go to the store, no one speaks like that. I want to go to the store or I want to go there um, because you want to communicate as fast and efficiently as possible. So when you are immersed in an English speaking country, the way that you want to communicate, the fastest way is going to be in English. So it takes a lot more processing for you to be able to take it out in that target language. So that's why you're going to get a lot of this rebellion. I've never met a student, whether it's a teenager, a college student, or an adult who has ever said, I cannot stand that my parents forced me to speak this language at home. In fact, you see the opposite. I always hear, I really wish my parents were more strict on me in speaking that language. Because once you become an adult, it's a lot harder to learn the language. Whereas if you're getting that exposure at home, I mean, people pay really good money to get that exposure at home. So, the, and I'm currently dealing with a grumpy preteen right now, who is even me as the linguist <laughs> who has a doctorate in this. I am still getting my son who will code switch to English with me. So then there are a few things that we do. So the first one is, I'll just say, I don't understand you in Spanish. I have no idea what you just said. And he's like, oh my gosh, yes, you do. I have no idea what you just said. And then I'll walk away and then he'll say, fine, it's this, this, and this in Spanish. Oh, great, let's do that then. Another way is as much as possible to try to 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 try to like create buy-in. Um, so why do we need this language, dear Francis? Oh well, you know, I know it's our culture, and we pass our culture through language. Great. What other reasons? So I'll show him videos about all the cool things that you can do with language. He wants to be a pathologist right now at nine years old. So you know, we're gonna be able to do a lot more research and be able to talk to a lot more people if you speak to them in Spanish and Japanese. Um, so really creating those opportunities to see where their language will take them so that they then create more buy-in to want to learn the language. And honestly, um, also showing, asking them what they want to learn. So he's learning Spanish because that's our heritage, but now he also wants to learn Japanese. So because he's learning Japanese, he's starting to find that Japanese is easier because he knows Spanish. So that's really making him want to learn more Spanish because that's helping him with his Japanese. And of course, the biggest buy-in was that we took him to Japan last year for two and a half weeks, and he was communicating with all the restaurant owners, with people in the streets, with the kids in the playground. So he saw the benefit of being multilingual himself. So whatever little ways that you can create that buy-in and to create um, incentives for them to learn, as well as really making it clear, you need to speak this language at home because this is our heritage. This is how we're going to pass our culture to you is really the best way. And you're still going to get pushback. And that's the time that you breathe and you just try again the next day. Yeah, that's that's the best way to go at it. Oh, I love it. I love it. I, I love that you just say, well, I don't understand what you're saying. That's really good, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they, they're talking to me in English and I still don't know what they're saying. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, that's <Sorry>. true. <laughs> <laughs> that's very true. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, that's really great. That's awesome. Okay. So, you know, you, you know, you're looking out and you see you know, when you're making a decision, especially like for adults, you know, um, and I think for young people as well. And it's like, and I see when I'm traveling and I'll see these signs and it's like, you know, either, you know, learn Spanish in like three weeks or learn English in, five, you know, five weeks or whatever it is. What, 
you know, what do you, what do you know about, you know, what's your experience with that? I mean, is that really possible? I, I haven't done it. So I haven't put myself in. It's like, well, I'll take this class and five weeks later, I'm going to be speaking the language because I just felt like I'm not sure if that really, you know, how that's going to work, but you know, and, and those things sometimes are pretty expensive. So what, what have you noticed about that? And what would you recommend for people that, that see a program like that? Is that something they should consider? Yeah, so I would say that if it looks too good to be true, it's too good to be true, even like lose 40 pounds in 40 days. I mean, you know, inherently that there are things that are just physically impossible and that take time. Even children whose first language is English, they did not learn English in five weeks. It takes a lot of time to be immersed and to kind of create that grammar and to practice that grammar. So what those programs could be good for is like some really good immediate exposure. And of course, what they don't tell you is that you go from speaking zero Mandarin to speaking some Mandarin in five weeks. Sure, that's true, but it'll probably be a very novice level Mandarin. Like you can say hello and how are you? Survival Mandarin, right? Um, but don't kind of give your money thinking that you're going to go from zero proficiency to being able to live in, you know, China and speak Mandarin to everybody in five weeks. Um, the best programs are the ones that keep you consistent. Because even things like Mango Languages, Rosetta Stone, Duolingo, I mean, they're good for exposure and they're good for practice. But what ends up happening with a lot of them is that if you are not very consistent and do it every single day for 30 minutes and you do it once a week when you forget about it, when you get like that little angry owl that comes and like yells at you on your phone. Uh -huh. um, if you only do it once a week for 20 minutes, you're not getting enough exposure or enough practice. So there are ways to leverage those tools to in your favor in terms of getting you exposure but you have to be consistent and you have to find ways to not just ingest the language but produce it that is where people like have the misstep just because you're remember maybe like you remember these that a long time ago they used to have books on tape that you would fall asleep with your earphones and they would right. just be speaking the language to you and supposedly you're going to wake up and speak the language of course not because you're not speaking it so you can ingest all you want but if you're not putting out then you're never really going to speak the language oh uh, that's good you you know it's funny you mentioned duolingo so i'm on uh i have a 441 day streak you nice. know i've been like consistent every day doing something and you know I, I took that on um about a year and a half ago i was like you know what i'm really gonna like this is it and it's time and i thought for sure in a year i'd have this all done you know uh, yep. And, you know, but what I do know is that I know I'll have a lot more vocabulary, but the, you know, for Duolingo, what it does is it maybe it just, it gives me a, a little more comfort in knowing that I'm going to practice and I'm going to try some new words out. But it's so often, it's like the more that I see there, it's like, I just, I start to realize the more that I see is the more that I don't know, as opposed to mm -hmm. what I do know, because I get to the next lesson and it's like, now we're going to talk about things that happened in the past. And I was like, what, wait, we that's all different. And, you know, and then you get this whole, this whole other, you know, this whole other setup. Uh, so yeah. again, it just comes back to the practicing, but I do, I still notice, as you were saying, you know, it's like when I'm talking to another person and when I can communicate with them in that language, even if I've got the tenses mixed up, they, they know what I'm talking about. And then they'll help me with the proper way to say, it, which has been, which has been really, really awesome. So that's, uh, it's, you know, it's exciting and I think it's a great tool, but it's, I, I agree with you. It's, I don't think it's something that I would say, okay, well, I'm going to, this is how I'm going to, you know, say this is how I'm going to learn the language. It really does right. come from speaking it and talking to people and practicing, you know, it's like anything yeah. else, you know, you practice music so you can perform. Why not practice language so you can have a conversation? So exactly. Really, really great. I'm so excited you're doing this with your own children in your home and, you know, and, and that you're also sharing even for them and having the background you have, and even for them, they get to that point where they kind of bump into that's like, mom, not today. You know, it's kind of like, yeah. but I, you know, I think we see that as homeschool families, we see that in almost any subject. It's like kids sometimes just want a break. Right. And so there's that time to take a break and then there's a the time to get back to things. So just, uh, Correct. Yeah, it's great. Um, so for Actful, if people happen to be in the Tampa Bay area in Florida or uh, does, does Actful serve, uh, Actful, do they serve uh, clients outside of the Florida area or do they need to be in Florida to do that, to participate yeah. in the so in fact, Axel is based in Virginia. Um, we are a global company. Um, I just happen to live in Virginia because they let me work from home, which I am very thankful for because that allows me the opportunity and the privilege to homeschool. 
Um, but yeah, so you can, um, anyone can access us at ACTFL.org. Um, we are starting because I'm the director of professional learning. I've really been doing the push to make sure that there's a platform for homeschoolers, uh, for anyone that wants to engage in language learning or language educating um, so that they can have resources for students at home. But anyone can access our website, regardless of where they are, even outside of the country, um, to get really great um, resources on the benefits of learning a language, how best to teach a language or learn a language, um, what are some really good you know, ways to like look at standards or proficiency guidelines. So we have all of that available on our website. Oh, wow. Okay. ACTFL.org. Actful.org. That's awesome. Correct. All right. We'll make sure that's in the show notes so people can find it and uh, and check all that out. And you know, if it's okay with you, I'd love to have you come back. And this is because I think there's so much more we could talk about. And, Absolutely. You know, and I'll have to practice practice up a little more Spanish so that uh, the next time we talk, it's for me, it's just encantado and eh, muchas gracias. So. Perfecto. Perfecto. <laughs> <laughs> so super happy to have you here today and uh pleasure pleasure to have you and you know for our listeners today it's you know sometimes i think they get to that part about thinking about oh i just you know that just seems like too much right but you've just kind of opened the door that it's not it really isn't i mean we can jump in and we can get started at any yeah. time anywhere so well, i think that's awesome very well, good thank you. yeah well dr celia thank you for being here today for everybody tuning in to a plus parents appreciate you being here and we'll see you next time bye everyone